action figures based on Marvel superheroes are quite commonplace today, with successful toy lines such as Hasbro's Marvel Legends, and with the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe on the big screen. While the heroes from the comic pages have been a staple in the toy aisle for decades now, it's hard to argue that there was a boom period for the genre that came about during the 1990s, partially thanks to a mutually beneficial partnership between the comics company and a small toy company, as well as the rise in the popularity of a certain mutant super team. We're diving into the launch of the popular Uncanny X-Men toy line from Toy Biz, today on Toy Explosion. primary attack. As Juggernaut harnesses his battering ram, Magneto reveals his magnetic force. Leave the attack, Juggernaut. But with him are the X-Men. Evil mutants. Wolverine flashes claws of steel, while Cyclops turns on laser power. This city is a speed limit. And the giant apocalypse is powerless by the mighty Colossus. Lost again, Magneto. X-Men and evil mutants, each sold separately from Toy Biz. This is Marvel What If issue number 37, released in May of 1992. It's the very first comic book I ever bought, and there's one reason I chose this specific issue. The man on the cover, Wolverine. You see, at this time, the first wave of uncanny X-Men action figures from Toy Biz had already hit the toy aisles. Fellow kids in my school were already abuzz about them. I saw a friend's Wolverine action figure at school, with pop-out claws and a removable mask you could wear as a ring for yourself, and I was instantly obsessed. I needed to track down this figure for myself. In fact, I needed all of these figures. But before we begin our look at the toys, let's learn a little bit about how this line came to be. In 1990, toy company Toy Biz struck a pretty amazing agreement with the Marvel Entertainment Group. Instead of signing a short-term license deal that was typical for the toy industry at the time, Toy Biz instead exchanged 46% of its equity for exclusive, perpetual, royalty-free licenses to Marvel's characters. This alliance would become mutually beneficial to both companies. It essentially eliminated royalties. Instead, Marvel's stake in Toy Biz would ultimately give them higher returns than typical royalties would have, and the upcoming slew of animated series based on the Marvel characters would essentially work as commercials for the toys, benefiting both companies. 1991 was a huge year for Marvel's X-Men. The now famous X-Men number one, written by Chris Claremont with art by Jim Lee, just launched that October and was hugely successful. Along with that, Toy Biz launched the first wave of their new Uncanny X-Men toy line. The first series gave us nine figures, five heroes, and three villains. Let's start by discussing the packaging. Our heroes came packaged on these bright orange card backs that featured the X-Men comic logo in a large font on the top and an illustration of the character to the left of the action figure. The upper corner featured the Marvel Comics logo with headshots of each of the heroes released in the assortment, tying the overall look of the card back to the covers of Marvel comic books. The villains came on darker purple colored card backs, but they featured the same X-Men logo and illustrations of the characters on the left side. These packaging designs would remain the standard until the mid 1990s, and many of these first figures ended up being reissued. One big difference in the first year cards compared to the later releases can be spotted on the peg holes. This was later changed to a J-hook design, making it easier for kids to pull the figures off the pegs at the toy store. Nightcrawler was originally intended to be the most articulated figure in the first series, by having bends at both knees and both elbows. This was ultimately changed, as many of the figures in the first series ended up getting this exact same articulation. 
He does feature a poseable tail that adds a little extra to his overall poseability. It features a bendy wire inside, allowing you to flex the tail around into several positions. In an effort to translate one of his mutant abilities into an action feature, Nightcrawler has a suction cup on his left hand and his right thigh that allows him to cling to smooth surfaces as if he's climbing. In early development, the suction cups were originally planned to be on both hands and both feet, but ultimately switched to this final design. They function decently, but the issue is that you now have a Nightcrawler with these rather ugly suction cups at all times. When the line first launched, Storm was one of the most sought after figures because of her limited availability. Suffering from the old toy industry thought process of young boys not wanting to play with toys of girls, Storm was one of only two female action figures released in the line until the end of 1994. In early development, the plan was for the handheld lightning bolt accessory to light up when in Storm's hand. This was a little too complicated to pull off, and as a result, the final figure includes a non-light-up version of the lightning bolt accessory. Instead, the lightning bolt emblem on her uniform was given the light-up feature instead. By touching the button on her back, the light would glow inside the lightning bolt. This light was known to burn out rather quickly, so finding them still functioning today is less common. This first Cyclops action figure is wearing his blue and white X-Factor uniform. Coincidentally, he stopped wearing this costume in the comics at almost the exact same time this figure hit store shelves. Like Nightcrawler and Storm, he features knee and elbow bends. However, he lacks head movement due to the light-up action feature. By pressing down on the small lever on his back, Cyclops' visor lights up red to mimic his optic blast mutant power. Like Storm, the light was known to burn out rather quickly. For an accessory, he includes this odd-looking device that snaps over his hands. Even as a kid, I didn't know exactly what this was. Is it a blaster of some sort? A battering ram? It turns out, this is the Cerebro computer. Cerebro plays a pretty important role in the X-Men comics. This is an interesting take on that computer that's typically used by Professor Xavier. Colossus is one of the figures that lacks elbow and knee joints, most likely due to the included action feature. He features his silver-skinned paint deco, capturing his mutant ability to turn the cells of his skin into a steel-like substance, making him impervious to physical harm. The action feature is meant to show off his strength. A lever on his back pumps his arms up and down, which happen to be molded in a lifting position. He included an accessory that is an oversized barbell that you can rest in his hands. Now you can show off his strength by pumping iron. But it also works great for tossing other figures around. Fastball special coming at ya! This figure represents the post-Four Horsemen version of Angel, after Apocalypse genetically altered him, turning his skin blue and giving him biomechanical wings. The wings play into the figure's action feature. Small missiles on the tip of each wing are meant to recreate his ability to project his biomechanical feathers for attack. These small missiles are not fired via a spring like many rocket-firing toys. Instead, these are flick missiles, which work exactly as it sounds. You use your fingers to flick the missiles out of the wings to fire at foes, although admittedly they don't function very well. There is a small lever on Archangel's back as well that, when pressed, causes the wings to flap for a flying action feature. Wolverine is wearing his classic brown costume. This is another case where, in the comics and other media, Wolverine's yellow tiger stripe costume was about to become much more mainstream. In a cool moment of the action figures being appropriately in scale with one another, Wolverine is the shortest of the action figures, much like he was the shortest member of the team in the comics. He has a removable mask, something that's pretty unique for superhero toys of the time. Admittedly, the mask looks a little goofy when it's on the figure. But hey, at least it can double as a ring for you to wear. He comes packaged with a katana. 
Although it's not specifically named on the card back, it's possible it could be the Muramasa blade straight from the comics. And of course, you can't have a Wolverine action figure without his signature adamantium claws. The claws have a pop-out action feature. This is accomplished by moving the small tabs on the back of his arms upwards and latching them onto the small J-hook that is molded in. Wolverine does not feature any elbow articulation because of the snap-out claws, but the claws work incredibly well, and honestly, they're a lot of fun. Snicked. The first wave gave us three evil mutants, and we'll start with a look at Juggernaut. Like many of the other figures in the first wave, Juggernaut has a small lever on his back that triggers his action feature, a power punch. He also has this battering ram accessory that sits over his shoulders, which is a bit odd, considering Juggernaut is a human battering ram himself. Small wheels can be found on the bottom of his feet. The idea is to recreate Juggernaut running into battle by rolling forward while wearing the battering ram in order to plow over his foes. Much of the sculpt and the articulation on this figure were sacrificed for that gimmick. In the comics, Apocalypse can alter the structure of his body to change his form. This power is brought to the action figure in the form of an extending action feature. The waist and the legs can both be extended, making it look as though Apocalypse has grown in size. This action feature affected the overall design and sculpt, making him much thinner than he typically appeared in the books. His staff accessory has a similar extending action feature. By pushing the small tab on the side, a magic jewel is exposed, although it's not very jewel-like. Made of a solid blue plastic, it looks more like a small missile launching out of the accessory rather than a magic jewel as stated by the back of the packaging. The arch enemy of Professor Xavier and the X-Men, Magneto includes the most accessories in the first series. His action feature is also one of the few that does not hinder the figure's articulation or design. Small magnets are embedded in the palms of his hands and his chest. Included are these three pieces of space junk that have small metal plates on the back. This allows Magneto to use real magnetism to cling the pieces of space junk to his hands and to his chest. In addition, he also features a removable helmet and a cloth cape. The cape itself does seem a bit too small compared to how it appeared in the books, but the removable helmet is definitely a cool addition. The first series also gave us two vehicles in the form of the Wolverine Mutant Cycle and the Magneto Magnetron. These were completely made up vehicles created specifically for this toy line and definitely had that silly toy feel to them. Magneto's strange purple car takes Magneto's mutant power quite literally by having magnets embedded in several locations. You can stick the space junk from the Magneto figure to these sections, or you can use them to store the included magnetic discs. These discs can also be launched from the front of the car at any mutant who stands in Magneto's way. I'd love to see this get used in the comics. And while Wolverine is known to ride motorcycles from time to time, this one features giant versions of his signature claws attached to the front that would slash up and down when the bike is pushed forward. It also has this creepy face on the front. It's not even Wolverine's mask, it's just Logan's face plastered on the front of his bike. I had no idea he was such a narcissist. And then there were play sets. Recreating the popular danger room that the X-Men train in, two character-specific playsets in the form of the Wolverine Combat Cave and the Cyclops Light Force Arena first hit stores alongside that initial wave of figures in 1991. These are a lot of fun. The Light Force Arena has a small platform that you can plug your Cyclops figure onto. A button on a small joystick simultaneously presses the lever on Cyclops' back to ignite his optic blast light, as well as trigger three special effects within the danger room. By aiming Cyclops appropriately and pressing the button, you can blast a Magneto cutout, explode a cement block, or blast down a brick wall. 
Wolverine's Combat Cave features a similar joystick platform. By placing Wolverine on that platform, you can control the figure, moving him back and forth and spinning him from side to side. This way you can make Logan battle a robot, slice a hole through a Magneto cutout, or even slash through a wall. And finally, let's talk about the Marvel Super Hero Talkers. Also released in 1991, there were three X-Men characters released in this series. Wolverine, Cyclops, and Magneto. The figures differed from the standard figures. The main gimmick was in the form of a bulky backpack that plugged onto the figures' backs. There were three buttons on the top which triggered two character-specific phrases and an action sound. At first glance, the figures themselves don't appear too different, however, if you're someone who doesn't approve of action features, these might be more for you. The talking backpacks are easily removable, leaving you with a standard, articulated action figure. Cyclops is missing the light-up visor feature, which means his head can now turn left and right. However, the elbow articulation is absent from these releases. Magneto's helmet is not removable on this version. The helmet's part of the head sculpt, which actually makes it look less bulky. He's lacking his cape, but he does still feature one magnet in his right hand and a fourth piece of space junk that clings to it. And like Magneto, Wolverine does not feature a removable mask this time, which actually makes this version look much better if you typically prefer Logan wearing his mask. The one downside? He has very stubby claws this time. The first series of X-Men action figures was only the beginning for Toy Biz. With the massive success of the first nine figures and the debut of the now iconic X-Men animated series in 1993, Toy Biz would go on to release new X-Men action figures throughout the entirety of the 1990s and even well into the 2000s. Today it's well known for giving comic book fans a huge selection of characters, even diving into some of the more obscure character selection territory that was usually uncommon for toys. Most toy companies wanted to play it safe by releasing only the main characters that would be more well known by the general public. But Mutant Mania was quite the dominant force in the 1990s, and no doubt the action figures from Toy Biz were a contributing factor. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Toy Explosion. Toy Explosion is a Patreon supported show. This show could not be made possible without all of the awesome supporters on Patreon that you see right here on the screen. I hope you guys enjoyed this and please stay tuned because more episodes of Toy Explosion talking about a whole variety of different toy lines is on the way. Until next time, my friends.